Well, good evening, everyone. We'd like to call our August 26th meeting to order. Uh, we apologize for the delay. We had a few technical difficulties with the live uh, broadcasting of it, but we'll get the meeting started. Uh, welcome those who are joining us in the audience and those who will be joining us uh, by way of television. At this time, we would like to start with the invocation. We'll ask Mr. Jeff Darling, the YMCA of Sand Hills, come forth and give us the invocation. Ask that everyone would please stand. Immediately following the invocation, ask that you please uh, repeat the Pledge of Allegiance in unison. Mr. Darling, how are you? I am doing great. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you that we can gather tonight to learn more about what's happening in our city as well as understand decisions that have been made. And Father, we pray that you would just provide each of our council members and city officials with the wisdom that they need as they continue to evaluate what needs to be done to make our city a better place to live. And Father, we pray for unity as well, understanding that there's lots of opinions and uh, uh, desires that are out there, but we know you can bring it all together and unify this group as they make the decisions that impact us. And Lord, ultimately, we pray that the decisions made would help with uh, the safety of our city, with the growth of our city, and Lord, that it would continue to be thriving and a better place to live. And we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, the indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Darling, thank you for uh, the invocation. Uh, we appreciate all the good work that you're doing at the YMCA, but take just a few minutes and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and your work at the Y. Sure, thank you. Again, my name is Jeff Darling, and I'm the CEO of YMCA of the Sand Hills. And uh, I, I've actually only been in North Carolina for just over a year now came from the West Coast, from California, realized it was time to come to the right coast, and so very happy to be in North Carolina and, and part of the YMCA here. I think one of the things that thrills me the most is when we look at the mission of the Y, that it is to put Christian values into programs that affect growth in spirit, mind, and body for all. And I love that last part because that's exactly what it is. And I, I, if you are familiar with the YMCA, you probably understand that no two YMCAs are really the same because one of the things that we do is we partner with city officials. We partner with other nonprofit organizations throughout the city to help understand what the true needs in the city are and then see how we can leverage resources to impact uh, the, those needs in the community. And so a couple of the things that we've just kicked off this year, and I will be very brief, uh, but we just kicked off a teen mental health program and invited teens to come in and be a part of the YMCA where they can have memberships in our Ys as well as have professional counseling available, leadership development programs, things that really give them something to look forward to and get involved in. We've also been able to ramp up our swim lessons and drowning prevention courses. And uh, just to date this year, we've been able to serve over 300 families uh, with swim lessons and drowning prevention. And then, of course, you have traditional things like fitness and health and those types of things at the Y. But bottom line is we are thrilled to be a part of this city and be in this community because we know that there's a lot of work to be done and we love to be a part of it. So thank, well, you. thank you so much for that. Let's give him a hand for YMCA, uh, such a valuable organization in our community. And uh, I will say that when I met Mr. Darlin, I didn't realize it had been a year, but uh, he hit the ground running. He came in and said, you know, I wanted to uh, know what we can do to to lean forward and be more helpful in the community. So thank you uh, for that and what you're doing. Uh, at this time, we would like to acknowledge um, an award that has been a, a awarded to the city of Fayetteville. And I would ask... Um, a representative of the city uh, to come down regarding uh, the 2024 uh, Association of State Flood uh, Plain Managers Award, James Lee Witt Award for Excellence uh, for our watershed work. So I'll meet you at the podium. Yes, sir. Alicia, thank you. Um, 
Yes, I'm Alicia Lanier. I'm rep representing our public services department. And um, and I, I lead the watershed master planning program. So the city of Fayetteville has been awarded the prestigious James Lee Witt Award for local excellence in flood mitigation. This award was announced at the National Association of State Floodplain Managers Conference in June of this year. The award recognizes outstanding programs at the front lines of floodplain management, local programs where the rubber meets the road. I think that's us to a T, right? Um, the only other North Carolina community to receive this award in the 38 years they've given it is Charlotte Mecklenburg, and that was in 2009. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. So, um, so as we all know, our rapidly developing city has faced significant flood mitigation challenges, not only during extreme events, but you know, also frequent small events. In, in 2019, city leaders launched a multi-million dollar watershed master plan program to better understand and address the flooding across the city with a focus on equitable resource distribution, regional scale, size projects, and, and, and a lot of intergovernmental collaboration. This forward thinking approach has proven invaluable by generating projects that are ready when the right grant becomes available. So for example, we just kicked off the Russell Person Street Bridge replacement stream enhancement pro project. Uh, that that was uh, secured a, a brick grant, which was 15 million or something like that, and also a golden leaf grant. So we were ready when the grant became available. Uh, the Ivy Lion Project was awarded a disaster relief and mitigation grant as well. It's uh, three and a half million. So it's already paying for itself. Um, so the program's ambitious schedule and evolving requirements have led to these and other remarkable successes. And the award is to city council for our city leaders. Uh, your unwavering support has been crucial in helping us overcome challenges. So it has been our great pleasure to work with you on such an, an amazing undertaking. And uh, on behalf, I've never done this before, on behalf of the Public Services Department, it is an honor to present this award to the City Council of Fayetteville. <laughs> I wanted to see my speech from here so I could see you. Okay. Well, first, let me say thank you to uh, for this great award, the James Lee Wood Award. And uh, I've got to call Mayor Lyles in Charlotte and tell her that, you know, we show them how to do it here in the in, uh, city of Fayetteville. But this really speaks to um, the last several years of the city's commitment to get this right. You know, hurricanes of Floyd and, and Matthew in the previous years exposed some vulnerabilities in our community and flooding. Uh, we have not uh, obtained our full goals of making sure that all of the city uh, is protected, but we have done an amazing job with um, the manager and his team, Ms. Sheila Ambet back there and her team, of getting us prepared for success. You know, they've spent a lot of money on uh, this master plan, which, you know, when, when it came out, they told us how many millions of dollars it cost for a plan, and I said, you know, many city council members were, were skeptic and didn't see the, the skeptical and didn't see the value of it. But the fact that you have to be prepared when the resources are there, that bridge that she talked about that is being replaced, I think that was the highest award uh, given to uh, any in the state of North Carolina during that budgetary year. Uh, and now we're receiving this very prestigious award that hadn't been back in the state uh, in almost uh, 15, uh, let's see, my math is off a little bit, maybe 15 years. And, uh, but it just speaks to the commitment of the city council, of the, of the professional staff that does the hard work. And so we are very grateful for this today. So thank you. And at this time, I'd like to call uh, Chief Braden. If he would come to the podium, he has uh, some special folks that we need to recognize, new members of the, of the team of the Federal Police Department. Chief? 
So council, thank you, thank you for the opportunity. As we all know, today was the first day of school and the city of Fayetteville's new school resource officer program and traffic control officer program. Uh, we've had it in a very compressed time frame, put together these two programs uh, to have a successful kickoff to the school year today. And uh, we had a total of five calls for service at all the schools within the city limits today. Uh, but I want to save my voice for the presentation a little bit later. I want to invite uh, Major Hunt up, and he'll be able to tell you about the the work and the, uh, uh, put into successfully getting this this program off the ground and launched by the first day of school. Major Hunt, good to see you again, sir. Hey, good to see you, Mayor. Uh, Mayor, City Council, uh, City Manager, and staff, thank you for having us here this evening. I'm just going to go through a quick uh, timeline of uh, how we uh, came to where we are today. Uh, first of all, we wouldn't be able to do this without the HR department. They they tremendously helped us out a lot because we've done some things that we haven't probably the city of Fayetteville hasn't had to do ever in a short amount of time. I'm hiring some folks and they stepped up to the plate and assisted. So uh, I'm just going to do a quick timeline and then we'll introduce everyone here and tell you who they are. Um, May 21st, of course, everyone knows Chief Braden received a letter from the Sheriff's Department saying, hey, we need to meet on June 6th about uh, some TCOs and SROs. Uh, July 19th, we uh, posted our first Facebook page hiring SROs or trying to hire lateral SROs from other agencies across the state. Uh, July 22nd, um, correction, we had a workshop on the 19th um, to hire uh, um, TCOs, and there was about 50 people showed up for that hiring workshop, um, which the HR department helped us out with. July 22nd, we did our first advertising for um, for the uh, um, SROs. Uh, August 22nd, the city council signs a MOU with the county um, for us to take over the SRO TCO program. And then August 5th, um, uh, HR department came over to the uh, police department where we we put in orientated 41 TCOs in one day. Wow. And then they did it again on the 19th with 17 more additional, which left, got us at 58 TCOs. We still got a couple in the pipe that's getting ready to get hired. And we're still working toward that goal right now. We're back filling that with our uh, civilian traffic investigators until we fill those uh, gaps. But we're getting those gaps filled. And like I said, there's tremendous work done by the HR department and the civilians in the city and the federal police department. Um, August 9th, we had seven of our officers and two supervisors that attended the SRO course. So on day one, you'd have certified SROs in the school and a supervisor that's certified. So we had that uh, take place. And uh, August 12th, the newly trained TCOs, I don't know if you saw them out here doing traffic control, but we had them out here training, making sure they got proper training before they got out there on their own. And of course, today, August 26, we started and early this morning, I rode around and I was making sure everybody was in place and everybody was in place and they were happy and they all had smiles on their faces. And then our, we went and looked at our, um, our school resource officers and they were happy. I had one of my school resource officers talking to the uh, a full gym of students, letting them know we're here, we're here to help and told them where his office was anytime they needed assistance from the federal police department. So what we have here is we have the six SROs um, there are various schools in, uh, in Fayetteville. We're still working to get our, up to our 23 SROs. And then on my left side here, your right, is our uh, newly TCOs. We didn't bring them all in. We would have a whole staff here. But uh, I'm going to ask one of the SROs if they want to tell us real quick how their first day went, and then we'll ask one of the TCOs to come up and talk to you real quick. Right. Uh, real quick, first day of school was really exciting. Um, the staff was more than welcoming. Um, very complimentary to see the blue uniforms, set of gray uniforms. Um, but to keep it short, they're really excited and we're really excited to continue the year in the schools. So, hey. And the same applies to us. We're out there with those children, with those school buses, and our primary job is safety. Absolutely. And we did that. Right. Let's give him a round of applause, guys. So uh, you've already met uh, Major Hunt, who's uh, ultimately over the entire program, but i also like to recognize Captain Manley, who's done a tremendous amount of work, and Lieutenant Bohannon, who's done a tremendous amount of work uh, figuring out how we're going to do time cards, how we're going to get people paid, having all these orientations. A lot of work in the past month has gone on behind the scenes. And, and in addition, uh, 
Sergeant Takama is, is going to start off the program. We're going to have two positions for supervisors. As we get more SROs, we'll probably add to that second supervisor. The Sergeant Takama will be the ones uh, supervising day-to-day -day operations within our schools. That's, that's phenomenal. And welcome, you guys and, and those uh, gentlemen and, and, uh, and ladies uh, to uh, this new assignment that we've all been given. But we thank you for it, our children. Uh, and the parents, thank you for what you're doing uh, in our schools. So thank you. Let's give them a round of applause. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you to the uh, HR team uh, and to the management uh, for quick work in that. And uh, we really, really are excited about a successful school year that we're going to claim that. Uh, for this upcoming year, that uh, this will build bridges and not walls uh, with our children. Uh, with that, I'll turn this over to Mayor Pro Tem Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Stop. Do you want me to do my No, you're good. All right. Are we calling? Do you want me to do this? I don't know. What to, yeah, you had uh, you had a presentation. Yeah. Okay, but I'll give my announcement. Under, under the announcements, yeah. yes. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I have two things that I need to announce tonight. First of all, um, so for anybody that knows me, they know I'm a betting woman, and I made a bet, and I lost with Council Member Davis. So he, up here, uh, we were gambling, and he called me up and said, are you going to the game tonight? And I said, is Cape Fear playing Pine Forest? He said, they are. I said, okay, let's do a nice little wager. So our wager was whoever won, the other person had to wear the colors of the school and congratulate the school. So with that being said, I don't have much gold and blue in my closet. So I tried. And I am publicly saying congratulations to the Cape Fear Colts on their win, their big win, their shutout Friday night at the home of the Trojans. So congratulations, Council Member Davis. I'm ready for basketball season, and we will do it again and wear our colors and sit beside each other. Uh, now, now, Council Member Davis, you need, a, you need a redo because she still got some green in this blue. And he told me that when I walked up. <laughs> so she's kind of half in, half out on that. I walked in like this and he said, <laughs> I see green. I, <laughs> I'll, maybe I'll be better. Hopefully I won't have to be prepared during basketball season. So the second thing that I would like to um, announce is today is Women's Equality Day. And I just wanted to put that out there for the women and especially the women that um, walk the path for all of us standing, uh, sitting up here today. So I'd like to wish all the women happy Women's Equality Day. It was 103 years ago, I think, that we got the right to vote. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. And Certainly, we see the impacts of women in every level of the government from uh, the leadership here on the council, a lot more diverse than it, than it has been in a long time, uh, state level and possibly on the federal level. We see it already in the federal level and maybe ultimately in the ultimate office. But uh, moving to uh, recognitions, if there are no more announcements from council members. Uh, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge Council Member DJ Harris on the line. Council Member Harris, are you there? Yes, sir, Mayor. I'm here. Is he still in? Council Member Hare, can you hear us? Yes, I'm here. Is he still on? I'm here, Mayor. Oh, okay. All right. Well, you're there. Uh, welcome, Council Member. Uh, at this time, we would ask a uh, gentleman who is no stranger to this community if he could come to the podium, Mr. Johnny Wilson, have a uh, special presentation as a token of our appreciation for you and the great work you've done in, in our community. Yep. So I'll meet you at the podium.
Mr. Wilson. I don't know. It must have been a it must have been a misprint on my computer because it said something about 25 years. So you don't look like you're but 27, but it says, uh, we would like to present you, sir. Uh the highest honor that the city of Fayetteville can present uh, for your untiring efforts and work that you've done in this community for 25 years. I need to check that typo. But it says as follows, on behalf of the mayor and city council of Fayetteville, North Carolina, our city key and coin are proudly presented to Johnny Wilson in grateful recognition of his devoted interests and untiring commitment to the community for more than 25 years. And it's dated August 26, 2024. So thank you, sir. Um, well, <laughs> those that uh, know I know I can present and talk a lot, um, but I won't do that to you tonight. I am uh, thank you again, Mayor. Um, thank you, our city lead leaders. I'm more than humbled. Uh, on the way up here, I looked behind me and I saw a few familiar faces, and uh, I'm going to hold it together, at least a little longer. But uh, you guys, y'all got me again. You got me again. Um, this is what I will say, Mr. Mayor, and the rest of our city lead leaders. When everyone congratulates me about 25 years and what I've done for Fail Verbal Ministry, I just simply reciprocate that and turn it back. What this community, and Fayetteville Urban Ministry and you all, your support, your love and respect and honor for the things that me and my team do here, it has been remarkable. And so thank you all for the love, the respect, the support that you've all shown me, my staff, my family, my friends. Look at my granddaughter back there. Look at her. <laughs> um, 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 this is unbelievable. Um, Godspeed ahead, and I try my best to do this for another 25 more. All right. All right. Now. <laughs> Oh, beautiful, beautiful. That is uh, phenomenal. So thank you, Mr. Wilson, and thank you to uh, Fable Urban Ministries for uh, the important work that you do in our community, the selfless service that you provide to uh, the people of this community. Uh, this is just a small token of our appreciation for uh, what you've done for 25 years. And again, I uh, look forward to you doing another 25 more. Um, with that, we also have um, a very special recognition to uh, an awareness. This is uh, Black Breastfeeding Awareness Week. So we have prepared a proclamation. Ask Miss Angela Tatum <clears throat> if she could meet me at the podium. She's looking mighty peaceful tonight. So I hope that continues. <laughs> So, Mr. Mayor, as you're walking down there, ju just to say that the, the the three presenters that we are having between the police force, um, Mr. Wilson, and, and now this, we definitely are showing we are a can-do city because when things, when we need to fix something, we make it happen. So thank you, everybody, for all the hard work that you've done. Whereas World Breastfeeding Week is celebrated August 1st through the 7th with the theme Closing the Gap, Breastfeeding Support for All. National Breastfeeding Month is celebrated August 1st through August 31st with the theme of Nourish, Sustain, and Thrive. Black Breastfeeding Week is celebrated August 25th through the 31st with the theme, Reclaiming Our Narrative and Centering Our Stories for Breastfeeding Justice. And whereas families are a priority in Fateville and part of helping families to thrive is ensuring that they receive community support to develop and sustain healthy lifestyles. 
And whereas, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, American Diabetic Association, American College of Gynecology, American Academy of Family Physicians and other leading health organizations, breastfeeding is optional food for infants and whereas breastfeeding gives babies a healthy start in life and research showing that breastfeeding is associated with lower rates of illness such as childhood obesity, diabetes, asthma, emphysema, ear infections, other childhood conditions, research always show, also shows reduced risk of maternal breast and ovarian cancers, along with the lower rates of heart disease and faster recovery from birth and compared to the formula feeding. And whereas collaborating with health care providers and community organizations that can positively impact breastfeeding by providing prenatal and postpartum breastfeeding education and support to help mothers meet their breastfeeding goals. And whereas our community is proud to have Mama's Village Fateville, the very first breastfeeding clinic, which offers clinical lactation support services and the very first clinical lactation training program and is the very first community-based human milk bank in the entire East Coast, located in the heart of Fateville, downtown, Fateville, North Carolina. That is very impressive. Very impressive. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, let's clap for that. that. That is things that you read in magazines that you wouldn't think that would be in your back door. So that that is that was nice to read. Whereas by providing the support and welcoming environment for black and brown families to have access to black and brown lactation providers that offers diversity and representation in lactation care to help reduce disparities in black breastfeeding rates and improve black infant maternal health outcomes in our community encourages families to continue breastfeeding. Now, therefore, I'm Mitch Colvin, mayor of the city of Fayetteville, North Carolina, on behalf of the city council and more than 208,000 re residents to hereby honorably proclaim the week of August 25th through 31st as Black Breastfeeding Week. I here undo set my hand of the great cause, the great seal of the city of Fayetteville affix this 26th day of August, the year 2024. Mayor Mitch Colt. Hi, everyone. My name is Hamsa Rahman. I'm a licensed speech language pathologist and a breastfeeding counselor, and I'm currently attending UNC Chapel Hill um, in the MRTTI um, rotation program um, to become an IBCLC in the near future. And my goal is to um, bring support to Black and Brown women breastfeeding in our community. Hey everyone, my name is Lisa Dix. I am a mother of four and currently breastfeeding black mother. I'm also a full spectrum doula and um, and will be finishing my IBCLC with Mama's Village Fayetteville. I'm also the founder of two local organizations, um, the Rainbow Doula and our nonprofit organization Feels Inc. And it is our goal to provide support to Black mothers all over Fayetteville, especially in the Hope, towards the Hope Mills area and the Rayford area. And um, we have a special focus on breastfeeding, the, the journey of breastfeeding um, through and after pregnancy loss. Um, yeah. Hi. Hey, so um, 
Yes, I'm always excited about this time of year and about the uh, human milk bake um, that we have. Yes, we are the first on the East Coast, and we were also instrumental in helping two organizations, one in uh, Michigan and one in Pennsylvania, um, to start theirs as well. And a lot of our donation, uh, we don't take money, we don't use insurance, and all of our donations come from community members right here in Fayetteville. Um, and we just got two new additional um, moms that reached out to us to become um, milk donors in our milk bank. Uh, so, um, again, I'm glad to be here. Uh, why is this proclamation uh, important each year? It is to remind the community of a much needed work of the much needed work to normalize breastfeeding, human milk feeding as the norm for all human babies. It is also um, to encourage our community health systems, our one and only hospital, Cape Fear Valley Hospital, to acknowledge the disparities that black women face when attempting to feed their babies their human milk in Cumberland County, while initiation rates are pretty close with 89% of white women initiating breastfeeding, only 80% of our black women are initiating breastfeeding. When you factor in that with preterm birth rates, black women have 1.5 higher, 1.5 times higher rate than white women and black infant mortality is 1.8 times higher. How does this all factor into black breastfeeding. We know that the healthiest thing for preterm babies is human milk, but with the rates being as they are, this creates an unhealthier black community. What are the solutions? One, we need more black IBCLCs. As you saw, we're trying to do this. I'm the only person doing the clinical like training in the community. Um, Hamsa is going to the program that I went to in UNC. I do it at a community level because it is a sacrifice to be in this community and have to drive to UNC and um, participate in that program. So we need more um, IBCLCs that are providing that training in our community. Um, two, we need Cape Fear Valley Hospital to become a baby-friendly hospital. Um, three, we need the city of Fayetteville to complete the steps to become a breastfeeding-friendly city. Four, and we need to support um, paid leave for our new mothers, hourly and salaried, along with higher minimum wage, and five, we need to support our black mental health therapists, such as Daphne Fuller with their Therapeutic Wellness Solutions, and she's here tonight, and also Mary Hansen along with others so that we can help our mothers with their mental health in the postpartum period. Thank you for continuing to amplify black breastfeeding in Fayetteville, and we at Mama's Village look forward to working with our community partners to reach these goals and improve health outcomes in the black community. Thank you. Oh. And I have this uh, floral crown. We did our black breastfeeding photo shoot on Saturday, and we got these floral crowns from Johanna with downtown um, Market of Fayetteville. And um, I saw Dino's wife at uh, um, Caroline's bridal shower, and so she suggested that I wear this tonight. So that's why I have this floral crown. I don't just walk around every day with floral crowns. <laughs> Thank you. Huh? Your future wife, the one that will get you in control. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you and congratulations to uh, Mama's Village uh, to realize that we have uh, only location on the East Coast is uh, significant with the, that type of training. Um, and so continue to good work and the education that you do uh, for uh, breastfeeding and particularly in the, in the black and brown communities uh, to learn more about it. A healthier community is better for all um, all involved. So thank you. Uh, Council, as we move now from the announcements and recognitions, we'll move to 5.0 to city manager's report. Mr. Hewitt. Thank you, Mayor, members of Council. I would ask um, Assistant Manager Kelly Oliveira to come forward and um, provide the report tonight. She has some exciting news. Ms. Kelly, how are you doing? Good evening, sir. Good evening, council members. I'm doing well tonight. Um, I'm overjoyed to be standing in front of you guys this evening. I have... Um, one wonderful announcement and one little tease. Um, so FAA announced today that we are the recipient of a $5 million airport improvement program grant. Um, and this will fund our airport, um, our international arrivals facility, which will help us be a point of entry for international commercial, military, and charter aircraft. That is so, great. Way to go. And we want to give special thanks to Congressman Rouser's office for all of his work in helping us get that a, 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 a appropriation. 
at the federal level. So thank you. Um, and the little tease I'm going to give you guys is that later this week, I will be um, releasing a name to you guys uh, for an airport director. We have a firm offer issued and accepted for a new airport director at our Fayetteville Regional Airport. And once that person has made the appropriate announcements where they are, we will be letting you guys know. Sounds phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Mayor and Council, as always, say as well, if you'd like to stay up on the latest happenings in city government, if you would, please sign up uh, to the, receive the city manager's messenger, which comes out every Friday. Um, and you can do so by going to the homepage, uh, cityoffayetteville.gov. Um, All right. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt. Thank you for the good news, Ms. Kelly. Racking up the dough tonight, huh? So between you and uh, public services and the airport. So we appreciate all of our federal uh, partners uh, for sending those resources back. Uh, Council, as we move now to the next item, which is the approval of the agenda, uh, entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Uh, Council Member Banks McLaughlin. I move that we approve the agenda. All right. There's a motion by Council Member Banks McLaughlin. Uh, second, it looks like by Council Member Davis. Uh, discussion on that motion? All right, Council, look to for your vote on the agenda. Green. Uh, all right, Madam Clerk, uh, Council Member Hare. I think his green. mic is still off, but he said green. Uh, is he affirming that with you all? All right. So yeah, he's uh, he he indicated green, uh, Madam Attorney. Uh, does that work for you? Okay. All right. Motion carries unanimous. Um, moving to the next item, which is seven point oh, the consent. All right. Council, I'll entertain a motion for. Uh, consent. Mr. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion that we approve the consent agenda. All right. There's a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Jensen to approve. Mr. Uh, Councilman Thompson, is that a second? Yes, sir. All right. Second on that motion. Is there any discussion? All right, Council. Uh, if seeing none, I look to you for your votes. Green. Right, Council Member Harris said he's green. Uh, so I think that's it. all the votes. Motion is nine to one. Those voting in opposition, they're going to show us the vote tally. Council Member Benevente, is that you? Voting in opposition. All right. So motion carries nine one. All right, Council, moving to uh, the next item are the staff reports. Uh, 8.01 is the uh, federal. Fire Department 2024 second quarter report. Chief, how are you, sir? How is everyone tonight? Good. Good evening, everybody. I'm here tonight to present the uh, 2024 second quarter review for the fire department. Uh, we're going to start tonight. Um, recognizing some retirements. These five retirees you see tonight on your screen total over 140 years of combined fire experience. Wow. Uh, we thank them for their service and commitment to our city. Uh, this was Assistant Chief Vincent Lewis with over 30 years, Assistant Chief uh, our Fire Marshal Joseph McLam, who gave us five years but had well over 30 in the service. TJ. Battalion Chief Bob Bowers, 30 plus years. Captain John Gerber um, actually came over to us from the Lake Rim rollover in 2004 and gave us 20 years, but he had 20 plus with Lake Rim. And Lieutenant Scott Gonzalez gave us 20 years after a military career. So we thank them for their service. Uh, with retirements come promotions and the next round of committed individuals prepared to make our department better and leave their mark. Uh, we have Deputy Chief David Rickmeyer, who will take over operations, Assistant Chief Michael Altry, who will take over our hazmat, Assistant Chief Daniel Mafia, who is our EMS coordinator, Captain Andrew Bumgardner, Lieutenant Jeremiah price Pecan, Lieutenant Jonathan Robb, and Lieutenant Benjamin Williams. 
We're also excited tonight to announce that we have hired our first community risk reduction specialist. Um, I'd like to say I came up with this, but I can't. I poached it from some other cities that have gone this route and it's working for them. Miss <laughs> um, Mary Murphy is an educator by trade, and we look to her to take our department to the next level of community risk reduction. Uh, Miss Murphy is going to work with our risk reduction staff and our operations staff to take a deep dive and a focused approach and identify risks and concerns in each risk reduction zone within the city. Um, we're still going to do our normal community-wide education, but we're now going to begin to focus more heavily on risks that may only affect isolated parts of our city, provide uh, focus education and um, learning opportunities in those areas as well. So we look forward to working with her. Um, before I get into the numbers of our responses, I would like to share that we have uh, purchased electric vehicle fire blankets and we've put them in both city owned parking decks. And we've also collaborated with Cape Fear Valley Hospital and got them installed in their parking decks as well. While we're not necessarily sold that these blankets will extinguish an electric vehicle fire, we are sure that they will help us provide protection to the multi million dollar parking structures while we work to mitigate the fire. Um, our response time averages remain consistent. So far for the 2024 year, we're arriving on scene from the time of the 911 call in seven minutes and 23 seconds. Our goal and our benchmark, as you remember, is eight minutes. As a reminder, our accreditation model requires us to measure times in the 90th percentile. So what that means is we take all of our calls and average the top 90% and that's where we get our numbers. Our fire response uh, is relatively unchanged. I would like to, to uh, bring your attention to the uh, fire starting in the kitchen. Since 22, we have seen almost a 5% reduction in that. And we'd like to thank that's uh, fruit from our kitchen and cooking fire education and prevention efforts. Our top three fire losses for this quarter are an apartment fire on Waterdown Drive a single family home on Diamond Road and the uh, crematory at Rogers and Brees on North Street. Our EMS and rescue responses have remained consistent, nothing exciting or interesting to share. Our hazardous materials responses show a rise in carbon monoxide and hydrocarbon emergencies. We have Look for the past three weeks, and I can't tell you why, and I can't give you a smoking gun. But con conveniently, this is where our CRR specialist will come in, and she'll dig in deep to uh, those areas and find out what's going on, and we'll start the education process. We're also going to start reporting on lithium-ion battery fires moving forward, so you'll see that in the next uh, next quarterly report moving forward. We are, as a city, starting to see more and more of those. So our human resources and where we are as a department on staffing. Uh, at the end of the second quarter, we were 21 sworn firefighters short. 19 of those, wait a minute, hold on, excuse me. One vacant civilian position, that's a fire inspector. That number is somewhat misleading. If you take those 21 vacancies, and add the 19 firefighters that we currently have in the academy, the true number of empty seats on fire trucks is 40. Uh, the 19 in the academy will graduate Wednesday night, and when you're all invited to that, 6.30 at Kingdom Impact Global Ministries. Uh, but then they have to go to EMT school. So these 19 folks won't be on fire trucks until November 1st. We have extended contingent offers to the 21 vacancies um, starting this past Friday and, and on through today. We hope for them to come on board on September 23rd. Uh, 15 of these are from our certified hire recruitment and they'll be ready to go on shift November 1st as well. So that'll put 39 of our 45 empty seats um, back on the road. The other six will start the full academy and be ready for work in early 2025. I say all that to say that our focus is shifting somewhat from all recruitment to lean a little stronger into retention. The pay increases you all approve should certainly help us with that. We've had seven resignations in the second quarter. 
Uh, of those, three transitioned to other fire departments and four left the service completely. So we're monitoring that hard and heavy. On a positive note, we had six reinstatements this year, um, and that's calendar year to date. Uh, I like to think that these folks tested the waters elsewhere, but decided that the FFD was where they wanted to be at, so they came back home. Our demographics um, remain fairly constant uh, at about 23% minority representation. Your goal for us is 30%. As you know, uh, we continue our recruitment efforts with that goal in the forefront. These charts are summaries of our advancement and training opportunities. I like to tie this back to retention because we're proud of our training and professional development availability and opportunities, and we ultimately want to tie that to our retention. We've made some internal process improvements to increase our efficiency on fire inspections. Our numbers are starting to reflect that. The one non-sworn vacancy, as I said, is for an additional inspector, and we hope to have them online by the end of September. We continue to make efforts to educate our developers and business owners and operators to reduce the amount of violations. As you see, nearly half of the violations are code compliance issues in the plan review process. We're developing a new construction packet to be shared with developers prior to plan submission to combat this. Sprinkler issues continue to be the top violation, followed closely by fire extinguisher issues. We successfully held our Community Emergency Response Team, or we like to call it CERT, Teen Academy in June. 18 ninth through 12th graders took part in this week-long academy, learning not only emergency skills such as CPR, fire extinguisher techniques, things like that, but also life skills. We'd like to thank our partners, uh, being the North Carolina State Fire Marshal's Office, the Cape Fair CERT, Fayetteville PD, Cumberland County Sheriff's Office, the North Carolina Highway Patrol, Cape Fair Valley Health System, and the Marius Maximus Foundation for Mental Health, and also the Stony Point Fire Department. What we're most excited about is our community involvement numbers. Uh, this quarter, we installed 47 car seats, held 10 CPR hands-only events, 385 in-person outreach and community events reaching over 17,000 adults and 7,000 children, installed 694 smoke alarms, replaced 29 batteries, installed 80 carbon monoxide detectors, and 16 stovetop fire suppression units. And if you're wondering, I'm not happy with that. I want to do more. Uh, we want to invite you all to our annual 9-11 Memorial Stair Climb taking place at Segrep on the uh, 14th of September. Uh, opening ceremonies are at 8.30 and the climb begins at 8.46 and all the proceeds will benefit the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. And of course, I always close with smoke alarms save lives. If you're listening or watching, please check your smoke alarm or call us at 433-1730 and we'll be happy to come do it for you and install a new smoke alarm free of charge. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Chief. Uh, I did have one question for you. You said something that kind of piqued my interest about the um, the blankets, you say, that are in the parking deck. So as uh, EV chargers roll out, there'll be you know, anticipated there'll be more uh, installed. What is, what is the the danger of that? Do you see a lot of um, fires? Uh, what, what What was your the basis or the genesis of your statement about that. Okay, as um, I pick with the manager all the time about his Tesla. Um, <laughs> we have not had one yet in our city, but when we do, and we will, electric vehicle fires are almost impossible to extinguish. Wow. They pretty much are going to go out when they want to. Um, the fire industry is working on ways to combat that. Um, they've come out with some products. The best looking one that we have found are these fire blankets. And basically it's a large tarp made of some uh, non-combustible material that basically smothers the fire and keeps it from um, spreading and make, getting worse. And you know, in these concrete parking decks, 
constant fire on that concrete will cause it to spall and fail. So our goal is to put these blankets over the cars while we work to get it drug out of the parking deck or do what we have to do to mitigate it, um, saving millions and millions of dollars in uh, structures. We are working with the other uh, private owners of the parking decks, and we also are going to add some to our battalion chief vehicles um, because we're afraid that our first vehicle fire is going to be at Skybo and Morganton in the middle of Christmas traffic. But we're going to do our best to be ready for it. All right. Thank you. Uh, Council, any other questions, comments for Chief? I do. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, okay, so I'm going to go back to the EV chargers. Oh, and Councilman Thompson, I didn't see him after you. All of you have EV cars. We do. No, I was going to peak an interest. <laughs> so I guess my question is, and we are putting them into the parking garages, correct? Is that what I'm hearing? That's where we started. Yes, ma'am. Do we need to rethink that? Uh, I'm talking about blankets, not chargers. No, I, I know the blankets, but I guess my question is, did I miss something that it's the charging? Because when you have an EV car, they say you only can do but certain amount because it can catch on fire. Uh, I don't know about the codes on the charger wise. We're just talking about putting out actual vehicle fires. Yeah. Okay, I, I'm yeah. sorry. I, I It went right around my head. Okay, thank you. All right, Councilman Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chief, I wanted to ask about the uh, state recognition of fallen firefighters. Had that uh, ceremony been rescheduled since it was postponed due to the hurricane, since I know the city has a recipient? Uh, much to our chagrin, that uh, ceremony went ahead and went on on that Thursday while we were most... Um, Municipalities were dealing with the uh, effects of the tropical storm, so we missed out on that one. But we will be uh, recognizing them in October at our uh, service at the Fable Tech Training Center, and we will also be going to the uh, um, National Fallen Firefighters Memorial in May at the uh, National Fire Academy. Please keep Councilman informed. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Thompson. Councilman Mahadros. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that we accept the uh, second quarter review as presented. All right. It's motion by Councilman Mahandros. It's seconded by Councilmember Banks McLaughlin. Any discussion on that motion? All right. Seeing none, Council, I'll look to you for your votes. Councilmember Harris, your audio back up. Green, sir. Does he have his mute button pressed? Okay. All right. I think he, he's green. All right, let me vote. All right, Madam Clerk, that motion carries unanimous. Uh, moving to item 8.02 is the Fayetteville Police Department 2024 second quarter review. Chief, good evening. Good evening. I don't know why this thing is not letting me talk. All right, once again, uh, here to uh, present the second quarter uh, numbers and report. We'll be discussing our crime stats, some trend analysis, the crime fighting strategies, and our community engagement that we've had through the second quarter. Uh, I've started just about every quarterly report with this page right here. It, uh, green is good. The red is something that, that causes us concern. Uh, if you look, our person's crimes are down. We're about down about 3% across the board compared to 2023. Uh, we're down, we're actually up 2%, and uh, which is a total of 58 more individual cases of property crimes uh, for the year. But our felony arrests continue to trend up, and our misdemeanor arrests continue to trend up. As we look at the bottom half of that slide, you know, we've discussed in the past, as those numbers chase each other, I, I'm okay with that. Uh, it lets us know that we're responding and reacting appropriately to the crime that we see within our community. Uh, so, so again, as long as those numbers aren't converging, uh, that is always a good sign in my opinion. Uh, and, and I say this as well, and this, these numbers and these, uh, the accomplishments and the rest of this actual report are in spite of some of the staffing issues we we've had over the past year. So we look at our traffic stops, we're up 10% from where we were, we're at last year. Uh, and, and when we discuss that a little bit later, it's almost a mirror image of 2023 to 2024. Our crimes against society, those are all the proactive uh, stops. 
uh, encompasses crimes such as weapon, drug violations, other violations, which the state of North Carolina is the victim. You see that's down 12%. Uh, it should be noted that we did, you know, um, move a lot of our CERT, our community engagement response teams back to patrol to backfill some of the staffing issues we had there. They were responsible for a lot of that proactive work and, and we expected to see that decline in the crimes against society category. Our criminal apprehensions remain up uh, with an increase from about 9% since last, uh, la the compared to last year. So this is a slide that I, I think is really of interest to just about everybody across the city. You know, when we talk about perceptions, you know, last year we talked about all the things we want to do to influence the violent crime within our city. Uh, we had a record number of homicides last year with 52 total for 2023. Uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say that to date, there, uh, well, not to date, till end of the second quarter, there were only 12 incidents with 12 victims, which is a reduction in homicides of 57%. Rapes were down, uh, reported rapes were down uh, close to 40% at 39, and our aggravated assaults were down almost 35% across the board. Uh, as we go and move into the second half of the year, we're going to be taking a look to see what uh, what influences we had on those those individual uh, crimes. Uh, we're going to look at rape. We're going to work with uh, the Phoenix Center to take a look at reporting, non-reporting, and see if there's any issues there. We're going to uh, take a look at our aggravated assault, see which uh, programs potentially worked the best, whether it was us being in the schools, whether it was us out in the communities dealing with uh, other issues that, that lead to violent crime. But we're going to do that analysis and, 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 and truly try to figure out what is positively impacting these numbers. Our robbery incidents, you know, when we talk about violent crime, this is the breakdown of the total robbery incidents throughout the city. Uh, and that's just the breakdown of victims and suspects. We've got the same information for our aggravated assaults. As we look at the actual uh, the slide here, uh, homicides <clears throat> down 57% from last year. Uh, typo there, that that down for the overdoses should be 40%, uh, 20 to 12 is 40%. And then suicides are down by 14%. One of the questions that uh, I was asked to report on was uh, gun incidents, gun related incidents as they uh, relate to homicide. 100% of the, the homicides have been gun related. Uh, and out of that 12, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, the Devon case is two of those. So outside of the Devon case, which were prior year homicides, all the ones that we had so far up to the second quarter involved the use of a handgun. Our suicides, there were 77% of those involved in the use of a handgun, and uh, the other was 23 that didn't involve the use of a handgun. A quick update to our, our shot spotter, the sound thinking. Uh, shot spotter program. Uh, as we look at it, we can see the Campbellton district, the district along uh, Murchison Road has the highest reported alerts for the districts at 95 total. Uh, we look at the shell covering, uh, shell casing recovery rates by district. Uh, naturally, with more sh shots being fired, uh, with more incidents, we actually got about half of those cases where shell casings were uh, discovered. Cross Creek is probably our best percentage rate of re uh, recovery. Uh, with alerts, uh, and, and naturally, you know, sometimes there's more than one shot fired, so we actually had more shell casings recovered than we actually had calls for uh, reports for shots fired. Uh, as we look at the time and day of the week, you know, uh, Wednesday night uh, is showing uh, the most active day for shot spotter, that followed by Sunday. Uh, and that Sunday is actually, you know, could lead into that Saturday night into Sunday morning. That's where we see a lot of those. As if you look at the time of the day between 9, 10, 11, 12 o'clock, all the way to 2 a.m. are our highest rates of reports for shot spotter. And I have a more comprehensive 10 month report that captures all that that will, you know, that will be available soon. So our federal partnerships, this is, you know, uh, working with our uh, task force officers. Uh, we've had 11 individuals federally sentenced, our 11 individuals uh, that are indicted pending adjudication, we've seized over $76,000 uh, 
uh, and criminal proceeds. We seized 13 firearms and we continue to work with the U.S. Attorney's Office with a VICAP violent criminal action plan under the Project Safe Neighborhoods. Uh, this time last year, we were talking about all the changes that we were bringing about uh, through our domestic violence from the retraining that went department wide to the partnerships that we have with the Phoenix Center. If you take a look uh, for 2024, we're showing that misdemeanor uh, domestic violence incidents are down by almost over 60%. The felonies are down by uh, 30%. And the simple assaults, assaults where we can't really prove anything because we are forcing officers to take those reports, refer them to seek uh, warrants. We're seeing uh, an increase in those across the board at about 13%. But, uh, you know, very pleased with the shift in the numbers as it relates to the domestic violence. If you notice at the very remember the very first slide we talked about the property crimes was at a slight increase, and I circled the motor vehicle theft here. If if you look back to the previous quarterly reports, this has been circled for several since about this time last year. Uh, we identified a trend where the larceny of motor vehicles were were at the forefront of some of our juvenile activity, uh, and and you can see last year we had uh, close to 700 incidents across the board, and we're well on pace to surpass that for this year. We're up 32 percent from where we sat last year, which was a, a very record a record pace for us as well. If you look, most of the other things, the burglaries are down by 1.72%, not a whole lot, but down overall. Uh, robberies are down by 18%. It's just that, that, that motor vehicle theft and, and what we're seeing is a trend leading to the, the, the resident, uh, motor vehicle B&Es that occur overnight when uh, juveniles are walking neighborhoods, apartment complexes, things of that nature. So we follow that with the juvenile slide. I'll start on the on the right columns. Uh, the things that concern me, the numbers in red. If you look at assaults, we're at 102 uh, assaults so far for this year. We only had 152 total for last year. So we're seeing some, uh, and these aren't the, necessarily the felony assaults or simple. They're, they're just assaults across the board. We're seeing that they're being more reported at the juvenile level. If we look at the B and E's, we talked about you know the problems we're having with with kids in the neighborhoods and the apartment complexes. We only had 78 total for last year, and we've already have 80 reported halfway through the year this year. And I, this is a reminder: these are the ones that we've obtained petitions for. So th th there's a lot more that juveniles are suspected of. We just haven't obtained those petitions for. If you look at robbery, there was a total of six last year. Uh, halfway through the year, we're reporting 11. In motor vehicle thefts, last year we petitioned a total of 51 juveniles, and we've already petitioned 47 halfway through the year this year. If we go to the actual columns on the left, the custody orders, that is where we physically took custody and control of a, of a juvenile. Okay. For, for lack of a better term, that's the, the juvenile's arrest. There's only been 31 of those so far this year. Field contacts, we've encountered them out in the streets over 187 times. We've taken over 578 juvenile-related incident reports. And we've uh, got a total of 779 charges or petitions against juveniles. Out of those, 162 were for being a runaway. And the total juveniles involved have been a total of 460 involved in those crimes or, or those contacts listed above. So again, we're seeing an increase in our contacts and interactions with juveniles. Narcotics uh, are looking, uh, again, it's down, but 31 kilos of cocaine have been seized so far this year. Uh, meth, that is actually up by almost 10 kilos. Uh, the fentanyl, heroin, all those are, are show, trending down. And, and again, our, our staffing, we, we spread the, 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 the burdens of staffing across the department, and our narcotics unit is, is, has some actual openings and vacancies in there that could account for some of that. But um, we, we try to stay on top of all the drugs and, and guns moving in and out around our city. Our 911 communication center, look at the call. Uh, it just gives a breakdown of the, the dispatches for fire, police, uh, total phone calls processed, our audio requests, quality assurance. Uh, we've had... Uh, we've seen a slight downtick in our 911 calls. Uh, I spoke with uh, Lisa Reed this morning. We are seeing that, but it's a nationwide, tri nationwide trend as well.
our homelessness and mental health responses. As you know, we have a, a homeless officer, a homeless liaison, and a mental health liaison. Uh, these are the number of contacts that we've had across the board uh, from January to June. Significant numbers for, for three people to respond to when we talk about the homeless calls, uh, front lobby assists, our Salvation Army transports, uh, panhandling calls for service. So, you know, while our patrol officers do assist with that, uh, the big portion of this burden falls on about uh, three positions in our department, <clears throat> of which two are actually filled right now. Traffic fatalities, you're showing a slight increase uh, from where we were sitting at last year in both the number of crashes and the number killed. Uh, you know, we really need to uh, focus on some programs where we got our 2024 no more, but the focus on reckless driving, speeding, and things of that nature. Uh, taking a look at the number of pedestrians that have been struck and the number of motorcycle fatalities we've seen, we'll probably be working on some kind of campaigns to, for pedestrians and motorcycle enforcement or uh, uh, education on the second half of this year. Again, this is the, the, the map that we put to show where the traffic stops reported for the first half of the year are at. Uh, all the major thoroughfares are covered. There, there doesn't appear to be one sector or one district within town that is overly uh, populated with the number of traffic stops. So it looks like it's spread across our city. If you look at the total number of stops for 2023, we ended last year with over 50,033. Uh, so far, for the first half of the year, we've conducted 24,065. It's almost a perfect 50%. Uh, when you look at the, the ratio, the demographic breakdown of black drivers, white drivers, and other drivers, uh, the, the, the numbers have, have fluctuated a little bit, but they remain consistent with what we had uh, for all of 2023. The search rates for black drivers, there were 14,696 stops on black drivers. Of that, there were 510 vehicle searches, which accounts for about 3.47% of the stops. Out of those 510, drugs were found in 208 and weapons were found in 104. So about 60% of, of that, the stops resulted in some kind of seizure. Search rate, stop and search rates for white drivers. There was a total 8,459 stops. Out of that, 102 were searched. That's about 1.2%. Out of the 102, 48, 47% yielded drugs and about 18, a little over 18% yielded weapons. And all other drivers accounted for 1,011 stops. Out of that, 20 vehicles were searched, drugs were found in nine, and weapons were found in two. So off to professional standards, our use of force reported incidents are down from 2023. Our internal departmental investigations are down from 2023. Our citizen complaints are up by about eight, and our compliments are up as well. Use of force review, there's a total of 3,378 felony and misdemeanor arrests made by officers in 2024. Out of that, 31 incidents resulted in a use of force representing about less than 1% of all arrests made. <clears throat> Again, I remind everybody that we investigate all the way through the chain of command from the, the sergeant on patrol who's working with the officer. They go by, they take the initial report. That goes throughout the chain of command, routed to a lieutenant, routed to a captain, routed to a major, routed through the assistant chief, then back to internal affairs for a quality review, then brought to the chief of police for a final disposition. So a minimum of six times, every one of these use of forces are looked at and evaluated on reasonableness and effectiveness. Just to compare some of our use of force compared to uh, assaults on officers and, and resisting officers. And to our departmental staffing, uh, currently, we uh, not currently, as of the end of the second quarter, there were a total of 85 vacancies. Uh, I was asked to, you know, 
uh, come July 1, 35 of those have been frozen for the budget year 20, uh, 24, 25. Again, our, our largest portion of, of losses are through resignation, and we've had quite a few retirements this year as well. So uh, talk about our community engagement programs, our faith in action 2024. If you look, this is the, the kickoff for the, uh, this year. We started uh, late spring. Uh, there are over 70 plus volunteers at our, our, that event on that day. There were 12 plus groups, nonprofits, churches, and community providers, peer support specialists, and mental health providers participated in that day. We focused on addressing concerns of addiction, poverty, mental health within our community to prevent crime and disorder. Uh, and, and that day alone, uh, that day, community residents, there was 400 contacts. Uh, Narcan handed out uh, to 90 individuals, uh, individuals with food insecurities. They were provided food and groceries to hold a total of 300, 383 times for 144 families, hygiene supplies and uh, salvation uh, based on the Faith in the Action program. We had our training center open house on June 1st of this year. This is one of the things to carry over from last year when I, when I did my first 90 days, how do we open up our doors, invite people in, get to learn a little bit about the police department. This is sort of an extension of our Citizen Police Academy and also utilize as a recruitment event. Uh, we allow people to come in, walk around the training center. As you look, they got to see uh, uh, our, our ERT team, our emergency response team, our dive teams, they got to speak with our training staff. If you wanted, you could write, attempt to, to run a modified POPAT to see how you would place uh, on the physical uh, test for the entry level police officers. We had our booze buggies out. So just a real good community event and day for the department. March Against Violence uh, for Gun Violence Awareness Month. Uh, we, we chose the area of Murchison Road uh, with a uh, talking about asking for peace in the streets. We had probably about 20 individuals that joined us and and, and, and walk uh, to bring awareness to gun violence in the Murchison Road Corridor. Special Olympics torch run with Assistant Chief Joyce leading the, leading the charge with the banner. Uh, police week also occurred in that second quarter. There were multiple events that occurred from the field of blue to our officer uh, uh, award ceremony, to the placing of the wreath of the memorial, plus a memorial down at the sheriff's office in the LEC. Uh, we were also fed by the Fayetteville Police Foundation, and we had graduation from our Citizens Police Academy. So the multiple event, uh, just snapshots of the multiple events that we had during police week. Our ceasefire movie nights, again, events that we held that we truly believe, uh, you know, were, were to combat violent crime within our city, our ceasefire movie night and the stop the bleed events. We had those both in the second quarter. And that concludes what I have to present. All right. Thank you, Chief. Uh, did have a, couple of questions that I wanted to highlight. Uh, if you could go back in the slide to the stats. Um, you know, we, we always hear it when uh, crime is up. So I want to make sure that we, that we want to talk to you a bit about uh, what you think contribute to some of these great numbers. Are you talking about this? violent crime? Yes. Right. So I saw, uh, as you pull it back up, I'll, I'm looking at my notes here. Um, so it shows homicide down nearly 60%, um, rape, uh, nearly 40%, uh, aggravated assault, nearly 35%. Uh, we've done a lot trying to figure this out, uh, from pro proactive and reactive. Um, I see that, you know, uh, you said you made some, some different approaches to, uh, proactively, uh, some of the seizures that you've been able to get things off the street. Um, what would you say has changed? I know that the, the national trend is also showing a decline. Uh, it, it spiked after COVID for whatever reason, but now it's, it's trending and, and luckily we're trending, but these are good numbers. What, what would you think has changed or what are you seeing different? So if you remember, uh, 
I don't know if it was last quarter, but I did speak briefly in one of my quarterly reports that a bulk majority of our homicides were, were either drug robberies or, or writs that went bad. Uh, we had several of those in 2023. We had you know, made up for that with a lot of good arrests uh, for drug-related offenses. You know, we, we we were patrolling those parking lots, looking for those 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 parking lot deals, and 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 I think that, and it's not just one thing. There's no just one thing that you can put your finger on. You look at we've had uh, three successful stop the bleed events so far since that program's inception uh, over the last year. You look at you know the the tenants that we have at our ceasefire movie nights. I think it's a culmination of many many things. You know, you look at the we had a record year for homicides, but we also had a record year for a clearance rate. I think we were sitting at ninety eight, almost ninety nine percent. Uh, and and we probably would have been even higher, but we had a couple of homicides that we weren't able to close out before the end of the fisc uh, end of the year last year. So you know, I, I believe there's a, a no one single event that we can put our finger on. Uh, you know, just having that focus on violent crime, truly looking at numbers, truly partnering with other people outside of the, of the police department. Uh, to have that focus and, the, and to bring that attention to the streets, even though there was only 20 people in that march against violence, there were 20 motivated people that, yeah. uh, that made people stop and see their signs and listen to their message that day. So again, I don't, I, I can't say there's one thing that we've done that that could you know relate to this, or 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 be the the cause of it. But those are pretty impressive numbers when you know homicides are down 60 percent. Uh, and and 35 and almost 40 percent for your violent. I think it really causes us to question, you know, the perceptions versus the realities within the city. Yeah, and the last thing I'll say as a follow up, um, are you seeing a change in the in the recidivism? I know at, at one time you were doing a lot of rearrest, and that were uh, people were in and out, and then oftentimes there'll be a revenge or retaliation. Uh, how how's that going? So. so and again, when your numbers are down, you got to say that no, there's not that recidivism. When you're down from 52, you know, murders last year, the 12 total for the first half, and two of those being prior murders, okay, that didn't truly take place. You know, we're still putting in the work to solve that case. So ultimately, you're re realistically, we're looking at 10 true murders for for the first half of the year. So no, there's not that recidivism there. Uh, you know. Uh, the communities around us, you know, uh, the, some of those are experiencing their high years now, you know, uh, between the county, Robinson County, the, the number of homicides that have occurred over there. So I, I think just, you know, establishing that, that number one, don't do it in favor because you will get caught and odds are they're going to prove their case and you will get arrested. Thank you. All right. Uh, Councilmember Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chief, I wasn't going to say anything tonight because we talked a lot upstairs and you answered a lot of my questions, but... As you answered the mayor's questions, I think you're being a little modest. So I want to set the record straight a little bit. I think you're doing a great job because you have a great staff behind you. As I look behind all these white shirts back here, I see you got you got Hunt, you got Manley, you got my chief Strape, you got Hicks. I mean, you got Joyce. You got a number of, of individuals back there who have stepped up to the plate. And we need to applaud them for the great job that they're doing in our city and what they'll continue to do in our city. But something that you also uh, uh, didn't uh, mention was the two great outstanding officers that retired, and that's with Berg and Ramirez. So I'd like for you to tell the audience about what you have gained and also what you have lost. So ultimately, we lost almost 60 years of experience in, in two retirements of the assistant chiefs. Uh, and, and, and what we had there was... Uh, you know, for the last three to four months, they were truly assigned to be mentors to the upcoming captains, majors, and 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 when were made available to them to ask questions, pass on anything that they had learned. You know, when you look at uh, Robert Ramirez, his 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 career mirrored my career from the the work in the narcotics, the street crimes, the the SWAT team. When you look at Kelly Berg, it was it was it was a truly polar opposite. You know, from working in sex crimes, domestic violence, and being an advocate for those two groups right there. So, uh, you know, I I really had some some good assistant chiefs, and like I said, I, I truly wanted to take advantage of the knowledge, the uh, and skills that they had. Some of the you know. Uh, some of the relationships they had built over the years. So for the last about about two and a half, three months, I put them just mentoring the the, the staff that you mentioned earlier, the, the newly promotable captains, majors, and all those that were in line to get their promotions in the future. All right. Uh, I have uh, 
Mayor Pro Tem Jensen and then Councilmember Benavente. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So as we sit here and we see um, how our crime rate is going down and that through everything, I thought it, I think it was point oh three that it went up a little bit. And a lot of that was nonviolent crimes. Just for the listening audience, um, you know, we are the sixth largest city in North Carolina. And if you talk about Fateville to people in North Carolina, you would think that we, you know, we had the highest crime rate, that we had this and we had that. But I want to, for the record, to know that there are many cities that their crime rate isn't going down like ours is, and that they are still doing things and we are making a difference. And I want to thank you personally. And I agree with Council Member Thompson. Um, you've got a great staff and we see you out there. And I will tell you, my residents appreciate you very much. And they are they are behind you. So thank you. Thank you. Give me a pro tem. Uh, Council Member Benavente. Thank you, Mayor Colvin. Um, could you just hit up the second slide? I know that you mentioned previously, or I was looking at some past quarterly reports as well. Um, where we had total arrests up 10%. I know that this year, uh, or rather this quarter, crime is also up um, that 0.8, almost 1%. Did you say you had a, a particular reason or, or understanding of why that is? Yes, the number of motor vehicle thefts and the number of motor vehicle B&Es. We talked about that when we had the juvenile slide. We have a record number and we're on pace to double what we had on some of those categories. Now, but are you saying that arrests are up also in that category? When I say arrests are up, that's total arrests. When we look at every arrest across the board, that, the, those are those categories. But if we can go back to the juvenile slide, no arrests from the ones that they are accountable for. There was a total of motor vehicle beatings 80 and only had custody orders on 31 total. And um, on slide 16, you said uh, that there's typically a three person team. Could you update us again on how many are staffed right now for the CARES folks? Did you say that there was not a liaison for mental health? No, there's two out of the two out of those three positions. I have the the sworn officer position and the, the homeless liaison position that are staffed right now. And the reason I ask or try to get some clarity is I guess the last quarterly report, there was a section on the right hand column called direct calls to mental health community liaison. I mean, I don't see that on this um, quarterly report because I don't have one right now. We don't have a what? A mental health liaison. That's the that's the vacancy we carry right now. Okay. So where are those types of calls going in the meantime? Uh, nine one one. Okay. And then um, you made a point on slide eighteen about how things are spread out. Um, I think you uh, I just wanted to make a better understanding. It's spread out across our city, and enforcement is not happening in any particular area. Did did I understand that that was the point that you were making about this particular slide? Yes, uh, that, that, that you, you don't see anywhere, particularly in the city, where it doesn't appear enforcement actions are being taken. Where enforcement actions are being taken um, in, in a way that's targeted, is that what you're trying to say? Like you're not overemphasized in any particular area? Yes, so they're, they're evenly spread. There's not one side of the city that doesn't have representation when it comes to the enforcement. Um, and then you know, every quarter I've got to ask if you go to the next slide. Um, and I think it's it's particularly noteworthy, as you said, that the trend is consistent all of 2023. And then once again, this this quarter that um, compared to our population, 40% African-American, 40% white Americans here in the city of Fayetteville, that we still have this disproportionate rate. And I'm not sure if, um, you know, I've explained that, I don't know, in a way that everyone can grasp. Um, there's two people on city council out of the 10 of us that are under 40. And I can just imagine if everyone leaving the council meetings after the uh, session is over, we all speed on our way home. All of us, all 10 of us are speeding on our way home. We really want to get to dinner. Um, if consistently it was just me and Malik that were getting pulled over 50% of the time, even though we only make up 20% of council, that perhaps, you know, despite the fact that we're all speeding, it would be out of the ordinary for just two of us to be kind of pulled out like that every time, especially if everyone's doing it. Uh, and the reason I, I believe everyone's doing it is because your own numbers show when you look at the white drivers that you stopped, their hit rates are, are, are the same, if not worse, right? 47% of the time they're having found drugs on them. 
other amount of time they're having weapons on. It's consistent no matter your demographic. It's just one group seems to be, you know, stopped more often than not. Because we don't pull to conduct searches, we pull based on violations. Certainly. So I guess, is that another way of saying that you, your your belief or your your enforcement is, is, is telling you that black people are more likely to break the law? No, what I'm saying is, is you, you're the one that wanted me to present these numbers right. in that manner. Sure. So no matter what we pull a car for, as long as probable cause exists, and, 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 and I give the same explanation all the time. We have to establish probable cause to do a valid stop. Once that stop is conducted, probable cause may be generated to search the car, either for weapons or, or other contraband. So how do you explain this disparate number if you're saying that it's, 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 it just happens that way every year, every quarter? Which disparate number? The fact that the population of Fayetteville is 40% black, 40% white, and yet we stop our black drivers twice the rate of white drivers. The only way I can explain that is, is race is not a consideration for a traffic stop. I, I get that, but the numbers but, come out to what the numbers are going to come out. And it's just crazy like that, just every time. Well, if it's consistent. So do you think that we'll be able to arrest enough people to where they'll stop speeding? A very few people get arrested for speeding. For drugs, for whatever it is, do you think we'll arrest enough people often enough that they'll start to well, uh, do no. drugs less or conceal fewer guns? No, I, I never said that. But I'm asking. That's what I'm asking. But I do know that the police officer's job is to enforce the law. Sure. There's a speeder, and we're out, out there. All you have to do is go to our social media accounts, go to a community watch meeting. The, the, the citizenry will, will tell you that that's what they want us to enforce. They want us to stop the speed, stop the careless and reckless driving. And the only way to, for us to enforce that is through traffic stops. But you don't believe that you'll effectively arrest enough people to where those behaviors change? So, no. I, I'll say, No, I'll say this. I'll say that there will always be work for law enforcement in the city of Fable because there will always be speeders. It's to get a better drill and mitigate the amount of speeders, mitigate the types of violations that are occurring through enforcement. And I guess the reason I ask that question is that, like you're saying, every quarter the numbers are consistent. No matter what you guys have done, every quarter we come back and we still have the same uh, percentages of drugs being found, weapons being found, um, the disparate impact on one demographic over another. It seems as though no matter how much more you arrest or don't arrest, so that the so, numbers end up more or less the same. So yes, you're correct. We've shown this where we compared to the years that we've had 100,000 traffic stops sure. and the numbers, the, the actual ratio right. is what you're speaking of. Yes, sir. Are consistently about the same. You talked about doing an analysis of the impact of some of these numbers. I think you were discussing. Yeah. Councilman Benavente. This is last that, that other speakers. Do we? Oh. I mean, go ahead. Okay, sure. this is the last question. Um, you talked about doing uh, an analysis of the impact on the numbers, uh, I think specifically as it related to, um, just trying to find the slide here that you're referencing, I believe it was slide number 12. Could you say more about what sort of analysis you guys are planning on doing? I think you were talking about what works and what doesn't work. Uh, for for 12, uh, there's not a whole lot of analysis needed there. We, I've been saying for the past year that motor vehicle thefts specifically amongst our- I'm sorry, it might've been slide five actually that you were referencing that you were, um, going to have some kind of impact analysis. I just want to understand more about what that was. So sort of, I think that was the point of the mayor's question when he opened up uh, the question section of, of what has worked, what has led to these drastic reduction in numbers from, you know, the homicide. Again, I think there's a multitude of things that we we, we implemented over the past year, whether it's the, the inclusion of uh, the Phoenix Center for, you know, domestic violence to, you know, the efforts we had on parking lot drug deals where mo most of our shootings and homicides occurred in some of our, a lot of our apartment complexes last year. So, so again, I, I, I don't think there's one thing that I can pick out, but, but yes, we, we do evaluate, you know, the impact that the Phoenix Center has had, you know, uh, I didn't include it in this slide, but I, I get uh, quarterly reports from them on the number of contacts they made. Uh, the number of follow-ups that they've done. So, so those are all things that we're considering that that would have that, but th there's no one pill answer that, that that has cured everything. No, and I think that's important that you're doing that kind of impact analysis because I feel like that's what's missing with our traffic stops and searches. You know, I've really we've like actually done that several times. We've done a decade-long breakdown that was presented when you first took office as a council person. Uh, I was the major at the time that put that those slides together for you, and any way that we broke it down that it actually came out the same. 
at some point we got to figure is it bias input from the police or is there some other factor that is causing that number to well, remain the same? I'll, I'll even go a step further and say I don't even think it's your job to necessarily address entirely. I think that what I want us to do is come to a conclusion about what at a certain point is just you guys gathering the data and presenting it to the decision makers and the policy makers to do something about it. I don't think it's for me to convince you that there's a problem here that you need to fix unilaterally necessarily, but I do need our city council to see that despite all the applause that you guys might hear from members of our community, um, and all the same way we, we we recognize that speeding and certain things are just perception and maybe not the reality of what the statistics show, there is a perception in this community that one group is unfairly stopped and searched. And you guys may not hear it all the time, and that's why I provide you guys with Facebook posts and emails that I get to show you that it's not just your guys' bubble where everyone is okay with what FPD is doing. In fact, there's a lot of concerns about what FPD is doing, whether it's valid or not, whether statistics show year over year, whether we do or don't do, it comes out the same. Right. There's a certain point we have to address that, um, and I think it's high time that we do that rather than just saying to everyone that everything is fine, don't look over behind the curtain. All right. Thank you, Councilmember Benavente. Councilmember Davis. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm not sure what number the slide is, but it's about the um, sound thinking shot spotter. Can you go to that slide, please, sir? So I actually have um, a community in my neighborhood, uh, in my district, who thinks that shot spotter is working pretty good for them. They feel safe with it. Um, how would you say you, you and your team use shot spotter to? Um, this is the Massey Hill district. So how do you feel that? your team is using, utilizing, and how effective is it? Because I don't see a lot of stats on here, uh, which is I'm very sad about, because if a community is asking for it, I think it's needed, but if it's not showing what it's supposed to be doing, I, I, I can't. So, well, and and again, I, I have about, it was about an eight or 10 page uh, rollout of the shot spotter sound thinking, because we're coming up on our, our the, the 10 month analysis of the actual program. Uh, if we're looking at the number of, of, of arrests that we made uh, that, that are directly related to shot spotter, that's probably not the most impressive number, but there are multiple leads that have been developed by a shot spotter putting us to a location where we find the shell casings that we have a knife and hit. That's our national incident uh, uh, firearms database that, that collects information about guns. And we are able to show that this this firearm that was fired at this location is related to several other incidents and being a, you able to use those as an investigative tool to tie everything together. So, you know, and I, I'll just give you a hypothetical situation. We keep going out to a specific location where there's multiple shots fired. OK, we're able to collect shell casings in that area. Then we have a shooting across town on the other side of town at a convenience store. Odds are, if we have repetitive shots fired at one location, we know our suspect from that shooting that occurred at a convenience store probably resides or is familiar with the area that we have multiple shell casings that were that retained. That gives us a lead that we can start going and doing door to door. If we have a, 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 a potential description of a suspect, we can actually pass that out and start to canvas the proper areas in order to work. So it's, it does provide investigative leads. What we do find is that there are quite a few uh, It's right at the 50% ratio. And I do actually have an actual that should be presented to you soon. Uh, the number of, of, of hits that we had, which is about 50% of those, uh, we, 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 there's no call for service attached to the shot spotter call. So that lets us know that, yes, we do have that to spend more times in those areas because, you know, they're, they're, we're not likely to get that call for the 911 call just because there was one shot fired and, and no apparent shooting. But again, I think the the evidence based and, and the leads that we're able to generate with it has led us to some great success. Okay, thank you. I just look forward for the, uh, more information. Thank you, sir. Thank All you, right, you Councilman Davis. Um, and um, thank you, Council. Well, uh, Councilman Benavente, I, I want to say one thing real quick before I go back to you. Okay. Um, I, I think that... Uh, you know, you you highlighted a lot of things that you know we've we've kind of debated on this board, right? But I want to give you another statistic that I believe is critical to this disparity that we talked about. So the poverty rate in Fayetteville, North Carolina, twenty five percent for blacks, eleven percent for whites, nineteen percent for Hispanics. Okay, statewide, eighteen percent for blacks, nine percent for whites. 
you don't just stop people for speeding because that's a choice to speed. Correct. So what may trigger a stop may be broken tail light, expired tags, um, are car not functioning. So so poverty does have means influence. factors into this, correct? Correct. So I want to make sure that we understand that, that there's an economic disparity that you have to, you can't ignore, right? That that causes some of these other things. So it's unfair to think that the police are just talking to people. If, if everybody was speeding that you pulled, that's one thing. So, But but stops are triggered behind a multiple multitude of things, which often comes down to somebody making a choice between buying food or renewing tags or so, lack of insurance and that kind of thing. The, the last quarterly report I put out, you know, when we talked about disparities, we did, I did do a comparison to the, the top cities nationwide, uh, not nationwide, statewide. Uh, and I, did, I didn't just compare traffic stop data. I compared dropout rate data. I, did, I compared poverty rate data. I compared multiple sets of data to show that, you know, we weren't the only, you know, if you actually look at it, city of Fayetteville probably doesn't stop more cars than the, the city of Raleigh. But on paper, yes, when you look at our, our TSRs, it shows that we stopped a lot more cars in Raleigh. Okay, you know, when as a as a leader of the Fayetteville Police Department, when I go to community watch meetings and people are complaining about speeding and reckless driving, when I look at social media, people are complaining about speeding and reckless driving. I have to put something in, implement something to mitigate the speeding and the reckless driving. We do the 2024 No More program where we're, our traffic unit is hyper-focused on those kinds of violations. Again, there are situations where registration may come into play, things like that. And I've said this, they're, they're, that circle of poverty, homelessness, and mental health, you know, the, the, they lead to a lot of the crime and disorder within our city. You know, whether we're talking about mental health issues, how, how, what leads to crime and disorder, those are the three things. So, yes, but we, we don't focus on, no, we're just going to pull expired registrations. You no, know, we're just going to pull, you know, the, the tail light that's broken. These officers establish probable cause, a reasonable suspicion for every stop, and, and take it to the, the limits that that stop can go. All right. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Councilman Benavente, you had a motion to accept? That's correct, your, uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'll just, I'm about to call your honor. I know. Uh, <laughs> uh, I move to accept uh, the, the FPD report. All right. So the motion by Councilman Benavente uh, to accept the report, seconded by Councilmember Davis. Uh, any further discussion? All right, Council, I look to you for your votes. Thank you, Chief. Thank you to your team. Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for your hard work and, uh, and these great numbers. Green. All right. All right. Council member uh, here. Green. Okay. He's green. All right. Madam Clerk, motion carries uh, unanimously. The report's accepted. Uh, great discussion. All right. Council, moving to the evidentiary hearing. Uh, We are now moving into uh, tonight's evidentiary hearings. Council decisions will be based upon competent material and substantial evidence which is presented. All those who are planning to speak must provide their testimony under oath. Those who are offering themselves as a witness or an expert of an issue must provide testimony supporting the individual's expertise. Council, at this time, I'd ask if there are any members of the city council who have any conflicts or ex or have had ex parte communications that they need to disclose at this time. All right. All those wishing to speak at the hearing, uh, please step forward so that you can be sworn in by the clerk. Thank you, sir. All right, we will now hear the staff report. Uh, turn it over to Mr. Harmon. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Uh, tonight, we only have one case before you. It is a special use permit uh, case issue P2405. Uh, this is a property located at 1011 Kane Road. It's just under an acre. It is in uh, Councilman Hare's district. And the request is a special use permit for single family attached dwellings or eight uh, townhome units. Uh, give you an idea of where the property is located. Uh, you can see here 
uh, by Varney Street and here on Kane Road. Uh, there's a set of apartments right here already. Uh, beside of it, there's 12 units uh, in two different buildings right there. Uh, this is, again, the uh, property beside of it uh, is also zoned SF6. Uh, along with this one. Everything else around it is the SF-10. Uh, our land use plan does call for medium density residential in this area. Uh, this is a picture of the property as it currently looks. Uh, again, those are the apartments that are adjacent to it. Um, the two parking lots uh, would kind of face each other. So you'd have, you'll see in a moment, the uh, new proposed buildings would be more over here with the parking kind of adjoining the other parking that's already there. Uh, just a little visual of what's uh, surrounding the property, uh, mainly single family, but again, the apartments right beside of it. Uh, this is the uh, proposed uh, layout of the subdivision, or not subdivision, but apartments, sorry. Um, and as you can see, again, you've got the parking and everything kind of lining through here. You've got two separate buildings, four units each, uh, and some detention area up in this area here. Uh, again, this is a special use permit, so we will have to have these six findings of fact. Uh, Mr. Mayor, that's all I have as staff at this point, and if you would, Please hold any questions for staff until after uh, the applicant has had an opportunity to present their case. All right. Thank you, Mr. Harmon. So with that, we'll now open the evidentiary hearing. Madam Clerk, uh, please call your first speaker. Mayor, our only speaker is Mr. George Rose. Good evening, Mr. Rose. Good evening. Um, thank you for your time tonight. Um, again, my name is George Rose. I'm the site engineer for the owner, uh, Michael Pleasant. And um, I'll go through the, um, the six findings of fact, um, uh, how the special use complies with applicable standards. Um, you, you take the total area of the property divided by 5,000 per the ordinance to come up with the allowable units. That comes up to 8.3. So we've got eight units are planned. Parking requirement is two spaces per unit, um, which would be 16 spaces. And we're showing 22 on the site plan. Um, how the special use will be in harmony with the area. Um, it's in harmony with the adjacent property to the south, which is developed, as Craig said, with two six-unit buildings containing rental townhomes now. Um, and rental properties also exist in the single-family properties to the east across Kane Road. Um, how the special use will not materially damage the public health or safety um, new construction will have higher rental rates and it'll attract uh, quality tenants for that area. The site contains public water and sewer utilities, adequate parking, as I said, stormwater management facilities uh, to minimize the impact of the development on adjacent properties. Um, how the special use is in general conformity with the city's adopted land use plans and policies. Um, the, the special use process is intended to allow the means of developing two and four family dwelling units within that FF6 zone. And so there are two buildings um, planned of four units each. Uh, how the special use will not substantially injure the value of the abutting land. Um, it will not injure the value of the surrounding land in that uh, multifamily units currently exist to the south, as we've said, and the site incorporates all UDO requirements in terms of setbacks, buffers, parking, and stormwater management. And then uh, how the special use will comply with all other relevant city, state, and federal laws and regulations. Um, this, the proposed use complies with all the laws and regulations in terms of connection to public roads and utilities, management of the site, stormwater runoff, density allowances, and all building code requirements. Um, I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. 
Thank you, Mr. Rose. The only question I have, can you tell us your background? I, I know you, but many may not. Um, my family has been in the civil engineering and surveying business here for many decades. My father was Saul Rose, the surveyor, and um, I've been in Fayetteville since 1983, practicing civil engineering and construction. So definitely not your first day of work. So you know not my first day of work. <laughs> All right. All right, Council, any other questions for uh, uh, Mr. Rose? Or All right. Um, seeing none, any uh, questions for uh, staff for Mr. Harmon? All right, Madam Clerk, are there any other speakers? Mayor, we now have no further speakers. All right, so Council, seeing no questions, no further speakers, I will close the evidence you're hearing and I'll go to Council Member Green. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we accept this application as presented based on the findings of fact, which are it complies with section 30-4C for this property size, and the formula would actually allow for an 8.3 unit um, property. This is an eight unit property. It is in harmony with the area and in keeping with the existing property. There are other townhomes to the south and rental properties to the east and throughout the area. It will not endanger the safety or public health, but being new construction should attract quality tenants um, because of the higher rents. It complies with the city land use plan in that it's a um, SP6 zoning and it allows, and that will be two unit, two four unit buildings. It will not enter the surrounding land in that multifamily units already exist in the area. The special use will not harm the value of the surrounding land and the site design will incorporate all UDO requirements with setbacks, parking, buffers, and stormwater management. And the proposed plan will comply with all laws and regulations in terms of connection to roads, utilities, stormwater runoff, and building codes. All right, it's a motion by Councilmember Green. It's a second by Councilmember Hare. Uh, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, Council, I look to you for your votes. Green. All right. And Councilmember Hare. All right. Councilmember Hare is green. All right, Madam Clerk, that is unanimous. Motion carries 10 0. So, congratulations. Thank you for uh, bringing more housing to the community. All right. We'll still adjourn.